All right, so let's talk about something called elasticity of demand. All right, so we were just discussing a minute ago how if you make too much of a product, it would drive down the price. And if it drives down the price, that can definitely affect your profits. So there's a balance in there in knowing what do I need to set my price to be so that I'm gonna be in a good spot to be able to maximize my profits um, and not leave money on the table, right? I mean, by the same token, we don't wanna to make too few of an item and realize that, oh my goodness, I could have made more or I could have raised my price and I would have actually had more profit. So in order to figure out something like that, we need to understand something called elasticity of demand. And elasticity of demand is this. First of all, we need to come up with um, an understanding of what the relative rate of change of the function is. Now, we are changing the uh, verbiage a little bit. We talked about like the average cost function before. You remember how we got that? We took the cost function and had to divide everything by what? By X, by the number of products we were making. And that would give us the average cost per item based on however many items we were making. So if we're talking about a relative rate of change, we're going to take our f prime of x, which is our derivative, right? And then we will divide it by the original function. That's our relative rate of change. Now, if we wanted to know what that is as a percentage, we could take that relative rate of change and multiply it times 100. So that indicates to us when we take relative rate of change, we should get a decimal. Or we, well, I won't say, we are likely to get a decimal, okay? Um, now, the elasticity of demand is what we can use to help us determine if we need to make an adjustment in, in, in this case, we're going to be looking at price. All right. So we're going to be looking at the price compared to demand of our item. And this is the formula you need for elasticity of demand. You're going to take whatever the price is, which is P. So they're going to give us a function that has P in it. And we'll multiply that times the derivative and divide it by the original function. Now remember this right here was that relative rate of change, the derivative divided by the original function. And then notice there's a minus sign in front. So what's going to happen is you're taking that relative rate of change and you multiply it times the negative of whatever your price is. Now, we look at those values and here's what we would know. If that elasticity of demand function comes out to be a value between zero and one, it tells us that demand is inelastic. Now, do you have any idea what that would mean? It means that I could raise my price and it's not really going to affect demand. It's like stuff that you have to have. Okay, and yes, if you think about, think for those of you who've taken some economics courses, you have some things that you buy, you just have to buy no matter what, right? I mean, yeah, for to a certain extent, gas. Now, there is a point where the price might influence your driving habits a little bit, uh, or it might influence the type of car that you purchase. Oh my, I don't know what they're doing over there. Um, in fact, my husband just recently, he buys and sells cars, so he just recently um, got a Prius that he's, you know, looking to resell, and he said, man, I tell you what, getting 50 miles to the gallon, I could really get used to this. I, you know, there are times it's nice to have a truck, but you're paying a premium in what you're uh, having to, to get in fuel mileage to, to drive a truck. So bread, eggs, milk, they're just certain things that no matter what they cost, you kind of need them. And so those items by nature are somewhat inelastic. Um, 
but there are other items that you've got to pay attention to based on the price to see whether, yeah. So if you end up with that elasticity of demand, when you simplify it out, if you get a value of exactly one, you know what that tells you? It, it, you're in equilibrium, okay? You, I mean, that. in fact, does that sound like that might be a good goal to where you want to shoot for? Because that would mean that the price and the demand are exactly equal, all right? But guess what happens if that elasticity of demand is greater than one? It says the demand is elastic. All right, so can you give me an example of something that you think this might? Okay. All right. So we've got one example of, say, an iPhone. I mean, hasn't Apple gotten really good at not even getting the bugs worked out of the phone they've released, and then the next generation is already out there? Um, I mean, so for people who feel like they have to have the newest, latest, greatest, it's almost impossible to stay current. And oh my gosh, the price of phones, what is it now? Is it in about $1,000 for the, yeah. Um, exactly, yeah. I mean, so that would indicate somebody somewhere has crunched the numbers to figure out what they can do to maximize profits. Now, for many of us, we would, we're would we gonna hit a point where we're gonna say, I'm not paying that, kind of like Caitlin just said. I do not have to have the latest, greatest. I can stick with my 5S and do just fine. Thank you very much. Um, think about Starbucks. Do you think they run a lot of analyses to decide what is the highest price that we can put on this product that will still get enough people to buy it that we're gonna be making our maximum profit. Absolutely. Now, does that then leave some margins maybe for competitors to come in and try to challenge? Sure, so there's a lot of factors at play here, but if you're just looking at what should I set my price to be, as long as you've got your equations that would represent um, what you're working with, then you can determine, all right, what's going to happen if I raise my price? Is that going to be a good thing or is that not going to be a good thing? All right, so let's look at a few scenarios here. And we're going to practice finding things like the relative rate of change. I'm not sure I wish I could get that to zoom in. And for whatever reason, it won't. I apologize. All right, so given this function, 42x uh, minus 0.3x squared, if we need to find the relative rate of change, according to our little formula sheet, we have to do what? The derivative? Perfect, the derivative divided by the original function. Now, can you differentiate 42x minus 0.3x squared? This is gonna be what? 42. Very good, minus, I gotta pull that exponent down, multiply it times the 0 0.3, so I get 0 0.6x. That's the derivative over what goes in the denominator. Minus 0 0.3x squared. And I'm done, that's all I need. That's it, that's finding the relative rate of change. It's just the derivative divided by the original. Okay. Now, if you look at this, they've given us a function, and it is a uh, price demand function. So we've got x equals f of p equals 12,000 minus 300 times p. And we want to find this elasticity of demand equation, E of p. Okay? Now, I want to explain a couple of things before we go. Um, any further with this. You know how we just looked in 11.4 when we did the chain rule and we had that last question that involved the cost of the cameras? And did you notice out to the side that X was between zero and 30? All right, and that meant that that equation was valid for any number of cameras you're producing between zero and 30. If I tried to produce 50 cameras, 
that's not necessarily a valid equation, right? Do you think it's possible the same could be true for something like this? Absolutely. So let me just show you so that if you ever needed to identify what is the actual um, values that would even make sense with this, here's how we can determine that. I want to know when this function, notice my, my x is uh, equal to this, so I want to have my 12,000 minus 300p, I want to know when it's greater than zero. All right, this is going to give me the value um, that should limit off on this. Now, to solve it, wouldn't I need to add 300p to each side? All right, so I'm gonna get 12,000 is greater than 300p. So if I divide both sides by 300, then I have, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna put p on this side, since it actually turns, if p goes to the other side, it's gotta turn the inequality around. P's got to be less than one. 40. 40. So this is going to be valid um, up to 40. Okay? Now, I still need to find what this E of P is. So E of P is, what did it give us for a formula on the other side? Minus P. Uh-huh. Good, that is it. It's a negative P times the derivative of the function over the original function. So let's do this. I'm gonna have negative P. Now, can you take the derivative of this? Derivative of 12,000 is? Yes. Zero, what's the derivative of negative 300 P? Negative 300, and I will be multiplying these together because it's negative P times that over Here's my original function, 12,000 minus 300p. So a negative times a negative gives me a positive 300p over 12,000 minus 300p. All right, is that simplified or is there anything else I can do? No, I wanted you to say no. Remember, if there's more than one term, if I see a plus sign or a minus sign, I can't reduce down to parts. This is it. I, you know, the only thing I could do if I wanted to simplify more is I could factor out a common factor. Could I factor out 300 on top and on bottom? That would simplify it a little bit, but I can't just mark out the 300p. So if I wanted to factor out 300, on the bottom, that would be 300 times what? 40? 40 minus P. And then I could cancel out the 300. So this would simplify to be P over 40 minus P. That's going to be as low as I can go. All right? Okay, your question. Uh, so if it was a positive 300P, you still could cancel out, right? No, you still could, because remember, <clears throat> I can only cancel out when I have common factors. So I can't just cancel out the 300 P's because the denominator is not 300 P. It's 12,000 minus 300 P. But if I factor out the 300, then I can reduce down the 300s. Okay, so be really careful about that. If it's more than one term, I can't do any canceling or reducing down unless I get things factored and I have a common factor. Okay? Are you going to let it on the It would be okay if you left it this way. That's just, I mean, since we talked about could you reduce down, I would just wanted to show you that would be all you could do to reduce it down. Now, that's all it asks for in this question but I think you may see a question like this in the homework. So I'm gonna kind of modify a little bit. And let's say you were asked to find where the demand is elastic. So in other words, I kind of need to know 
at what point am I going to price myself out of some customers? All right, because once it becomes elastic, that's when we get the iPhone users that say, mm -mm, not upgrading, I'm sticking with what I have. Or the ones that say, I'll just drink coffee at home, no more Starbucks for me. All right. Now, in order to find this, I want to know when this equation is what value. Do you remember? Is it when it's exactly one or when it's greater than one that it's elastic? There you go. We're going to take the equation we just found and we want to find when it is greater than one. Now, we can either use this one or we can use the reduced down form. So if I take the reduced down form, that means my P over 40 minus P, I want to know when it's greater than one. Think about proportions. Think of this as one over one. What would be the next thing I would want to do in order to simplify? I don't think I want to leave it as a fraction. So how could I get that 40 minus P out of the denominator? Well, I, let's cross multiply, exactly. Or think of it as multiplying each side by the denominator, the common denominator, 40 minus P. So if I multiply this side by 40 minus P, and I multiply this side by 40 minus P, wouldn't you agree that P needs to be greater than 40 minus P? Yes. Okay. And then I need to get the P's on the same side. So how do I do that? I'm going to add P to both sides, so that's going to turn it into 2P is greater than 40. And to solve for P, now I do what? Divide by 2. Divide by two. Here's what you should find. P is greater than 20. So any time that I get greater than, and I have no idea what this is, but since P represents price, if I go above $20, then I am now in elastic territory. I am potentially losing customers. So if I wanted to identify where the demand is elastic, it's going to be between 20 and what did we say was the maximum that even applied to this? 40. Wait, I'm sorry, I must have been the 20 came from setting this elasticity of demand equation greater than one, because that's when it becomes elastic. We wanted to know where would it be elastic. So I took what we found over here, and we set it to be greater than one. Because once we're in that value, we know we're potentially outpricing customers, okay? And so when we solved, we multiplied both sides by the denominator, 40 minus P, which turned it into this. P is greater than 40 minus P. We got the P's together on the same side. So that's how we got 2P is greater than 40. And then when we, we divided by 2, that told us when P is greater than 20, we get in elastic territory. This part that I showed you in the beginning, the reason we did this, we wanted to know when is this greater than zero because if X is talking about maybe, whether it's talking about price or it's talking about number of products, either one has to be positive, right? Okay, so that's why we said it greater than zero. So we discovered we had to be sure that we stayed less than 40. If, if you priced yourself beyond that, um, then, you are off the chart, nobody's buying anything, okay? So for sure, that's your, that was the maximum that we should uh, be able to um, use with this equation. So from 20, which is where it becomes an elastic, up to 40, anywhere in there, I've got an elastic um, structure for this price demand. Yeah. So with the property, you can get greater than 20 or on the 40, like for example. Well, it would, what you would look at in my math lab is whether it says express your answer in interval form. If it said that, you would do the 20 to 40. If it just asked maybe at what point do you have unit elasticity 
that's going to be at exactly 20, isn't it? And you would maybe type in P equals 20. As far as the test goes, um, I would specify if I'm going to be picky about one way or the other, but if you tell me P is greater than 20, I would probably be happy with that. Um, so, I, but I wanted to show you it's possible to figure out what your maximum needs to be. And then if you know where it switches from being uh, inelastic to elastic, then you could actually show this would be my interval. Now, from a business standpoint, would it make any sense at all to charge $40 for this product? No, I mean, you know, if you charge $40 for a hairbrush, you probably are not gonna get many people, if any, that would buy it, all right? Depends on the hairbrush, maybe, okay. Uh, but according to this, I probably wanna be closer to $20. All right, because $20 is sort of the everything's in balance. If I go a little under 20, I have not maximized my maximum return here, um, but a little bit over 20, I may potentially lose a few customers, but I have to decide if it's worth you know the offset. There are some other things I would probably look at to make the ultimate decision. But just looking at it from a price demand standpoint, that's what I would know. Now, this one, we're gonna modify a little bit. I do not know why they, this was a, a question that I pulled out of the class notes that the publisher put in here. And they picked really dumb values, in my opinion, for P. Um, and I'll tell you why. I crunched some numbers ahead of time. What we did up here, where we took the original equation and set it to be greater than zero, so I kind of know where the maximum boundaries were. I did that on this. Now, because it's quadratic, it was a little more involved. I actually used the calculator to help me see it. And I came up with the P needing to be between zero and 113, okay? These are all really low numbers. So when we try to answer this in a little bit, if we use these numbers, you're gonna look at it, you're gonna think, well, gosh, why, why are we doing that? So I'm gonna modify that part when we get there. Instead, let's go ahead and find what the elasticity of demand would be. And you said the equation is what? Negative, Negative P times the derivative over the original. Good, all right. This one, we have negative P. Now, see if you can differentiate this. The derivative of 850 is zero. What's the derivative of negative 3P? All right, so make sure you got a parenthesis here because we're multiplying the negative P times the derivative. So I've got a negative three, and now what's the derivative of negative 0.04 P squared? Good, okay, in, in a little bit, we're gonna have to distribute, aren't we? Over my original was this, 850 minus three P minus 0.04 P squared. So now, if we differentiate, or not differentiate, if we multiply, we get what? 3p, and a negative times negative is a positive, 0 0.08 what? p squared <coughs> over this original. And I don't see anything that looks like it would easily clean up, reduce down, let's just leave it in that form. That's gonna be that elasticity of demand equation. Now, here's how I want you to modify these numbers. We're gonna do it with P equals 45, P equals 55, and P equals 65, okay? So let's see what happens if we use a price of 45. That's going to be 3 times 45 plus 0 0.08 times 45 squared over 850 minus 3 times 45 minus 0 0.04 times 45 squared. Okay? 
Now I'm going to take the calculator. We'll just make sure we don't have any issues getting this in. When we do have something that's kind of complex like this, um, make sure you use lots of parentheses. So I'm going to multiply 3 times 45. Let's see if I can get that to show up a little bit better. Okay, and then we will add, and in another parentheses, I'm going to multiply 0 0.08 times 45 squared. That's my whole numerator. I got 297. And then my denominator is a 50 minus 3 times 45 minus 0 0.04 times 45 squared. And I got 634. So if I take 297 and divide it by 634, that's 0.468. Okay, you tell me. What does 0.468 tell you? Demand is, is it elastic, inelastic, or unit? If I get a 0.468. It's under one. It's under one, so that makes it inelastic. In other words, I could raise my price and it shouldn't affect demand, correct? Yes. We're good? I know, this is really irritating me that, um, in fact, let me, let me try this. Okay, I don't know if that affected um, what they can see on the recording or not, but that's all right, we'll go ahead and go with this. now. Evaluate, well, first of all, we said that was inelastic because the value was less than one. See what happens if we use 55. And if you want to, in your, if you're using one of these calculators, you can actually edit. And I can arrow back, and everywhere I had a 0.45, I can change it to a 0.55. That one does I know, makes it nice. All right, so that's going to turn into 407 over 564. I got. Point seven two two. You guys getting the same thing? Yes. All right. So what does that tell me? <coughs> it is still inelastic. <coughs> All right. Let's see what happens if we use sixty five. That gave me 533 in the numerator. And 486 in the denominator. I've now got one point one. Zero. If I round, oh, actually, I got one point zero nine seven. Let's do that because we were going three places. One point zero nine seven. What does that tell me? Ah, demand is now elastic because this value is greater than one, but it's just barely elastic, right? So if I'm wanting to be a little gutsy, I may want to go with 65. That's not too far off of one, and that definitely uh, makes more sense than charging something like 15, I don't know why anybody would even test that, um, to come up with the answer. All right, so questions?